So first of all, many, many thanks to both Nathan and Petar. It's been um, such a treat to come back to this conference um, several times now, and I'm really looking forward to presenting this and discussing um, this project um, with you all uh, here today. So um, this is a, a piece from a kind of larger project, which is my dissertation. So it's, it's sort of in progress, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting any feedback from you on it. So with that, I'll just begin. In one of his earliest works, titled Detumescence from 1966, the artist Dan Graham placed an advertisement in several newspapers and magazines soliciting an account of detumescence, which is the postcoital diminution of an erection. Graham's ad read, here's a close up of it here, wanted professional medical writer willing to write clinical description covering equally the physiological and psychological lassitude pleasure response of the human male to sexual detumescence. Along with two other works Graham made in the same period, Figurative from 1965 and Schema from 1966, Detumescence was one of the first ever artworks in the form of a magazine advertisement. Graham's use of the medium of the magazine has often been cited as an example of his critical engagement with the material presuppositions of minimalist aesthetics. Around the time of this piece, Graham was also beginning to write and publish critical essays, engaging the work of artists working within the minimalist tradition, including Carl Andre, Dan Flavin, Donald Judd, and Saul LeWitt. As Benjamin Buchloh has suggested, Graham's magazine pieces are not only self-referential works that follow a certain principle of minimalist art practice, but they illustrate Graham's critical intervention within the minimalist tradition. Namely, the magazine works reveal Graham's discovery that minimalist artists' ideas about materiality were, in fact, rather traditional and positivist, oriented at a neo-constructivist craft ethos. Through the works that Graham made in the medium of magazine advertisements, he posed a challenge to minimalism, pointing out that the minimalist's original radicality in questioning the role of the artwork in its social context had been given up, and that minimal works had been restored easily into the commodity status, acquiring exchange value in as much as they gave up their context-bound idea of use value. Unlike the works of Donald Judd or Carl Andre, Graham's early works like Detumescence underscored the presuppositions of material in minimalist art. Graham's magazine pieces radicalized one of the fundamental gestures of minimalism, the abolition of the artwork's commodity status, and the attempt to replace its exchange and exhibition value with a new concept of functional use value. In Detumescence and in his other magazine pieces, Graham emphasizes the materiality of language and embraces the medium of media as the material of his practice. Whereas artists in the minimalist tradition at that time, many artists saw the role of media and of art magazines in particular as being anti-art because the magazine photograph mediated the artwork and corrupted what, for example, Carl Andre called in 1968, the direct experience of art as something in the world. Graham's magazine advertisements, on the other hand, celebrated this medium and took the materiality of the printed page as the starting point for his practice. In a statement about the piece, Detumescence, Graham said that he had had in mind a page describing in clinical language the typical emotional and physiological aspects of post-climax in the sexual experience of the human male. It was noted that no description exists anywhere in the literature as it is anti-romantic. It may be culturally suppressed, a structural hole in the psychosexual social conditioning of behavior. I wanted the piece to be simply this psychosexual social hole, truncated on the page along as printed matter. To create it, I advertised in several places. In, in late 1966, I advertised for a qualified medical writer in the National Tatler. That was the version that we saw. In 69, the New York Review of Sex gave me an ad. As both of these ads were somewhat edited, 
I bought an ad in Screw in, in mid-1969. I have received no responses. <laughs> the piece detumescence then marks a hole, or perhaps instead it pokes one. That is to say, detumescence is a work whose gesture deflates. It deflates an essential pretense of minimalism. If minimalist art practice of the late 1960s advocated for the abolition of the commodity status of artworks, this very thesis became an element of what made the work even more saleable within the gallery system. Graham's detumescence marks his response to the phenomenon of these, this easy commodification of minimalist art, and his work goes further than his contemporaries, radicalizing the gesture to abolish the work's status as commodity by embracing the material of language and the form and format of the magazine as his medium. While most art historians and critics have written about the form of Graham's magazine interventions and addressed the radicality of the gesture they make, these commentaries focus on the way in which these works challenge the commodification of art and critique the gallery structure of the art world by rendering the work significantly more difficult to commodify. They emphasize the import of how the early magazine works intervene in the question of materiality within the minimalist aesthetics of the late 1960s. But no one, to my knowledge, is yet to address the conceptual content of the piece Detumescence in particular. That is, the specificity of Graham's reference to the biological fact of detumescence as a response to an implicit critique of artwork in the minimalist tradition work that notably often erected plainly phallic objects, remains to be thematized. To state the obvious, there is nothing about the concept of sexual detumescence as a response to the work of, say, Dan Flavin or Donald Judd that suggests a simple, neutral commentary on the material presuppositions of art practices in the form of minimalist artistic gesture. So what then of this account of detumescence? What is the explicitly sexual theme of this work to do with Graham's intervention vis-a-vis -vis the question of the material of an art practice? Is there perhaps a way to understand the biological fact of detumescence, the conceptual content of Graham's piece, in relation to Graham, Graham's gesture that foregrounds the materiality of language as the medium of his practice? The fact that Graham purportedly never received any responses is worth noting. And in what follows, I'd like to try to formulate a kind of response here today. A response that brings together the question of the materiality of language with the biological fact of detumescence, taking as our starting point Jacques Lacan's 10th seminar. Okay. Lacan discussed what he called the biological fact of detumescence in his seminar on anxiety. As a biological fact, Detumescence is the result of an anatomical particularity of the human male penis. The human penis is notably a spineless organ. Unlike many other mammals, including most primates, the penis of the human male is lacking the penile bone, which is called the baculum. In animals with a baculum, this extraskeletal bone provides a constant relative stiffness to the organ whereas the human penis relies solely on the so-called hydraulic means to support an erection. So the human erection is relatively unique in that it is sustained by blood instead of bone. This anatomical feature of the human male penis renders possible its various vicissitudes, including the form it takes in postcoital detumescence. For Lacan, the unique feature of the male body that we find in the detumescence functions as a signifier of the partial satisfaction within the dialectic of desire. It illustrates, and I quote, the value that the phallus assumes in its worn out state. It stands to remind us that essentially the object falls away from the subject in his relation to desire. This deciduous object suggests the impossibility of ever fully satisfying desire then. It shows plainly that even if you get what you want, you only do so to lose it. 
Lacan says, at the heart of the experience of desire lies what remains when desire has been, let's say, satisfied. What remains at the end of desire, an end that is always a false end, an end, uh, an end that is always the result of having gotten it wrong. The end which desire aims, the end at which desire aims is an impossible one whose impossibility is marked in the inevitable falling away of the phallus. In addition to its illustration of desire's constitutional frustration then, in the context of the anxiety seminar, Lacan's focus on detumescence evinces at least three central points. First, it establishes the relation, and perhaps more importantly, I think the distinction between the phallus and the penis, thereby clarifying the phallus's signifying function within the symbolic order. Second, it lends an essential image, or what Lacan calls an imaginary support, to the function of castration. Third, and finally, detumescence marks the intimate relation of orgasm and death, illuminating the relation of castration within the real. So, in what follows now, I'll take each of these points in order. <coughs> so what does it mean that detumescence establishes the relation and the distinction between the penis and the phallus? For Lacan, the phallus is a signifier. Early on in Lacan's second seminar, when he introduces the phallus, he explains that it signifies the part of the parent's desire that goes beyond the child, thus establishing the initial relation of desire as desire for the other's desire. The phallus then becomes a signifier insofar as it is a signifier of lack. Lacan often paradoxically calls the phallus a signifier of castration, insofar as it is a signifier of lack. In elaborating these various aspects of the concept of the phallus as a signifier of lack, many commentators have focused on the way in which the phallus is a purely symbolic function, and very much not a penis. Mitigating the frustration and often the outrage with which this, what is perhaps the most controversial concept of psychoanalysis, is met. But these pacifying explications of the phallus's purely symbolic function tend to be all too sterilizing, sterilizing of the concept that Lacan has in mind. As Elenka Zupancic has helpfully explained, we do not get very far if we keep simply repeating that the phallus is a symbolic function and that it has nothing to do with the penis. For we can then ask, why not, um, or why call, us, call it a phallus at all? Why not invent a new term, as Lacan was fond of doing, and call it a gapus or a lacus? In all his complex elaboration of the phallic function as symbolic, it never crossed Lacan's mind to say something like, but in the end, it doesn't really matter what we call it. No, instead, Lacan insists on the phallus, and he insists on it for a reason. So what I want to focus on here is the particular way in which the phallus is related to the anatomical particularity of the penis as an index. In other words, I want to try to make clear and think through why Lacan insists we call a phallus a phallus. Focusing then on this aspect of detumescence, it is the capacity of the penis to morph from an erect to a flaccid state, and vice versa, which helps to clarify what Lacan means when he treats the relation of the penis to the phallus as signifier par excellence. The phallus is a literal incarnation of the signifier of desire. But to understand this point in a more nuanced way, we might compare the vicissitudes of the penis to a discussion from seminar three, in which Lacan establishes the signifying value of the daily oscillation between day and night. He says, this is a long quote, so bear with me. <clears throat> Lacan says, the day is a being distinct from all the objects it contains and manifests. It's probably even more weighty and more present than any of them. And it's impossible to think of it, even in the most primitive human experience, as the simple return of experience. At a given moment, the human being detaches itself from the day. The human being is not, as everything leads us to think is the case for the animal, simply immersed in a phenomenon, such as that of the alternation of day and night. The human being poses the day as such. And the day thereby becomes the presence of day, against a background that is not a background of concrete nighttime, 
but of possible absence of nighttime, where the night dwells, and vice versa, moreover. Very early on, day and night are signifying codes, not experiences. They are connotations, and the empirical and concrete day only comes forth as an imaginary correlative. So Lacan explains that the naturalness that is often ascribed in the relation of day and night to, say, human sleep patterns, for example, is actually empirically false. He points out that there are all kinds of aberrations that deviate from such an account, including the fact that the first few years of life often entail sleep patterns that in no way correspond to the alternation of day and night. This point goes one step towards the direction of emphasizing the fact that day itself is a signifier and not just the background for experience, nor is it something experienced itself. In Lacan's discussion of the signifiers day and night, signification is a question not of comparison between two in which we find a continual materiality given in different forms, the world as experienced in day versus the world as experienced in night. Signification is a question not of comparison, um, but instead the signifier day is understood through a symbolic connotation, not against a background of concrete nighttime, but as a signifier, the possibility for there to be day and the possibility for not day, the fundamental alternation connoting presence and absence. Lacan's point here is that reality is at the outset marked by what Lacan calls symbolic nihilation. It's ne antisation. Symbolic nihilation entails then the positioning of a signifier, not against its opposite, which is already filled out with the content of experience, but against its absence. We can see in this, I think, a precursor, um, or we can see a precursor to this point of symbolic nihilation in what Lacan says in his uh, very first seminar in 1954. He says, the fundamental, the fundamental relationship of man to this symbolic order is quite precisely that which founds the symbolic order itself the relation of non-being to being. The end of the symbolic process is that non-being come to be, and this because it has come into words. So it is precisely in this sense that symbolic nihilation structures signification such that every signifier entails the coming into being of non-being. The signifier of day comes to be not merely an opposition to night, but in relation to its own non-being. There is an analogy to be drawn here between the alternation of day and night and the phallus's signifying function in the alternation of the erect and flaccid penis. The phallus as signifier has to be thought through the fluctuations of the penis from flaccid to erect and back again, not as some experience of the same thing or the same material in alternating states, but instead as a question of the presence and the absence of the phallus in the penis. The phallus as signifier is what the penis puts on, so to speak. The penis can don the phallus as a king can don his crown, and in which case we also call that crown a phallus. That is, just as the king's power as king depends on certain symbolic markers, like a scepter or a throne or the crown. These markers invest the king with his power, but they can also be taken away. Objects that symbolize power, that grant it, do so in such a way precisely, um, sorry, yeah. Objects that symbolize power grant power to the one who holds them, but it is precisely this granting in the form of an external object that needs to be emphasized. The king can be stripped bare of his insignia just as the penis can also lose the phallus. This is what Lacan is after when he says that the phallus is a signifier of castration. It marks that which can be taken away. The evanescence of the phallus, its capacity to fall away from the subject, the symbolic nihilation or neantisation of the phallus is marked by the biological fact of detumescence. 
In Dicimessence, the penis is no longer the phallus, but what is confronted is not just the penis. It is instead the absence of the phallus. Lacan says, this very existence of the mechanism of detumescence suffices to mark out all by itself the link between orgasm and what presents itself truly and verily as the first image, the first hint of the cut, the separation, the bowing out, the athanasis, um, it's a hard word to say, athanasis, um, the vanishing of the function of the organ. Okay, so, so what detumescence shows us is that the phallus is a penis and yet also, importantly, it's not. The penis and the phallus are the same and yet indeed as different from each other as night is today. It's not just that the substance of the phallus is the penis, for there are also many other phalluses. As Lacan says in his essay, The Signification of the Phallus, it can also represent the clitoris. But in its signifying function, the phallus is still indexed to the particular anatomical signifying features of the penis, which is the non-being out of which the being of the phallus emerges as the signifier of desire. It is worth mentioning one other anatomical particularity of the human penis and thinking through its role in determining the phallus as signifier. Namely, the penis's relative autonomy of enjoyment. The fact that its ups and downs are not necessarily under the sovereign control of the subject, which can be the source of the subject's keen embarrassment. This point is illustrated most clearly, perhaps, in St. Augustine's account of the generative organs before the fall of man. In The City of God, Augustine explains that the fluctuations of the organ were entirely under the control of the will before man's fall into sin and that if only men had remained innocent and obedient in paradise, the generative organs should have been in subjection to the will, as the other members are. So, um, you know, one of the two philosopher saints here um, recounts the, um, the way in which man would have sown the seed and the woman received it. This is a quote, obviously. Um, <laughs> Uh, as, as need required. So the man would have sown the seed and the woman received it as need required. The generative organs being moved by the will, not excited by lust. For we move at will not only those members which are furnished with joints of solid bone or baculum, for example, as the hands and the feet or the fingers, but we move also at will those which are composed of slack and soft nerves. We can put them in motion or stretch them out or bend and twist them, or contract and stiffen them, as we do with the muscles of the mouth and the face. Augustine goes on to suggest that man himself might very well have enjoyed absolute power over his members, had he not forfeited it by his disobedience. For it was not difficult for God to form him, so that what is now moved in the body only by lust should be moved only at will. Now, of course, the irony here is that for all of the potential control by the will that man could have had over his organ, the ability to put it in motion, bend and twist it, et cetera, et cetera, would have been bereft of the pleasure in doing so. One of the interesting things that we can extrapolate from Augustine's account is that the invention of lust, which coincides with the origin of sin, is the moment in which the organ of the penis is separated from the domain of the will. This separation, the severing of the part from the whole, is the condition of the phallus's specifically erotic function. Augustine's account of the generative organs before man's original sin suggests a prior paradise in which man was whole, not yet severed from himself in his body, a cut that we might think now by turning to a discussion of symbolic castration. Okay, so now I'm on to the second major point that detumescence marks for Lacan, which is that it offers an imaginary support of the symbolic function of castration. That is, detumescence secures the image, or the gestalt, the form of what Lacan calls the falling away of the phallus, indexing this image to a specific feature of the male body. Lacan says that detumescence and copulation deserves to hold our attention as a way of highlighting one of the dimensions of castration. The dimension of castration that detumescence highlights is the imaginary one insofar as it offers an illusion 
an image on the body of the falling away of the phallus's symbolic function. Lacan's discussion of the imaginary dimension of castration, as marked in the fact of detumescence, is a unique moment within the Lacanian oeuvre, because for Lacan, castration is almost always discussed in its symbolic dimension. This is particularly evident in Lacan's earlier seminar, the seminar four, um, in which he established that castration is symbolic and importantly distinct from frustration, which corresponds to the dimension of the imaginary, and from privation, which corresponds to the real. Without dwelling too long on the stakes of this threefold distinction in seminar four, Lacan attributes the conflation of these three um, sort of dimensions of castration, but the conflation of them into castration, with frustration on the one hand and privation on the other, to much of the confusion surrounding the role of castration in psychoanalysis. He claims that it would be utterly impossible to understand anything about, frustra about castration without distinguishing castration on the one hand from the imaginary phenomenon of frustration, which is marked in the experience of lack and conceptualized particularly in weaning and the loss of the breast. And on the other hand, Lacan says castration must be distinguished from privation, which is experienced as a real lack in the absence of the phallus as a signifier. So in distinction to these two kinds of lack, which are marked by experiences of separation, splitting, and absence, the dimension of symbolic castration marks a different kind of split. It is a split that conditions the very entrance into language. Symbolic castration marks the split as the price of admission into the symbolic order. That is, symbolic castration can be thought quite simply as the severing of word from thing, the cut between signifier and signified, whereby one is forced to give up the thing in order to access it through language. And further, the very existence of the thing is then paradoxically predicated on this very split. Symbolic nihilation, the néantisation, the being of non-being in language, informs Lacan's specification of symbolic castration as the structuring negativity of language. <clears throat> Lacan's notion of symbolic castration derives in some sense from the fact of separation, but is not reducible to it in every instance. In this way, it is importantly distinct from what Freud conceived of regarding castration, insofar as Freud established castration primarily as a fear of a particular potentiality, that of separation. Now, there's more nuanced accounts of castration in Freud, of course, but if we focus on the, the very last text that Freud wrote on the topic of anxiety, he delimited castration in terms of the significance of the potential loss of the object. For Freud, in inhibition symptoms and anxiety, castration anxiety develops as an expectation of object loss. It is the fundamental structure of separation that the ego comes to expect based on early infantile experience. Freud writes, the ego has been prepared to expect castration by having undergone constantly repeated object losses. These moments condition the later concept of castration insofar as they teach the subject to relate to the value of an object according to the potentiality of losing it. Freud writes, castration can be pictured on the basis of the daily experience of the feces being separated from the body or on the basis of losing the mother's breast at weaning. As such, at least in the terms laid out in inhibition symptoms and anxiety, castration has a place in a linear chain of causality. Castration anxiety is the effect of a series of events originating in early infantile experience and leading to the attachment to objects, an attachment that presupposes their potential loss. Ultimately, for Freud, this causal chain leads up to the development of morality and of sociality as such. Motivating an attachment to a group and the highest or most developed castration anxiety Freud says, manifests itself through the superego and as a fundamental fear of separation from the group. <clears throat> so the point here is that castration for Freud comes to mark an essential threat and a perceived danger in any potential separation. So while castration becomes a rather all-encompassing framework for Freud, and indeed for many of his interpreters of the early 20th century, 
Lacan aims to specify castration as something particular to the way in which one is situated within language. That is, Lacan shifts the concept of castration as the structuration of the signifier, which on the one hand renders castration actually much more specific as it is no longer about the experience and anticipation of any separation, but simultaneously in doing so, he renders castration as the very structure of language as such. So here with this move, um, Lacan renders castration um, on the one hand much more specific, but on the other hand like much more fundamental to the, to the structuration of um, the analytic framework. So um, in this way, Freud's account of castration is still reflected in Lacan's account, but it's rendered much more specific. Castration for Lacan marks the relation of a potential loss to something which is always already lost. Insofar as, as we said earlier, the relation, for example, of the king to his crown, um, symbolic castration marks a relation in which the potential for separation is presupposed in language itself. So one is always already castrated merely by entering into the symbolic order. For Lacan, to be in language is to be separated, uh, is to be castrated. Um, and the fear of separation is possible only in the case of that from which one is already lost and separated. The biological fact of detumescence underscores this by giving an image. The penis can be the phallus, but only at the cost of eventually losing it. In this way then, again, the penis both is and is not the phallus. And this is what Lacan means when he says that detumescence is the imaginary support of castration, marking the split between the phallus and the penis, the very split that marks the gap between signifier and signified. In Lacan's revision of the notion of castration as specifically symbolic castration, it is no longer some feared potential separation based on early infantile experience as it is in Freud's inhibition symptoms and anxiety, but is instead the signifier as signifier of lack. Right? Okay. Okay, so um, now on to the third section where I'm gonna try to think through the relation of castration in the dimension of the real. So Lacan's account of symbolic castration guarantees that in language, absence is also the possibility of an appearance, which is controlled by a presence that lies elsewhere. We have so far addressed both the symbolic and imaginary dimensions of this dialectic between presence and absence, but we've yet to really think castration in the dimension of the real. I'll develop this now by turning to detumescence as that which highlights the intimate relation of orgasm and death. The biological fact of detumescence as the imaginary support of this symbolic function of castration is linked intimately and ultimately with, with death, a link that evokes the dimension of the real, bringing us back, though in a different way, to the theme of nihilation. Detumescence finds in nihilation the common ground of orgasm and death. As Lacan asks, what do we ask of our partner in sex? We ask for the satisfaction of a demand that bears a certain relation to death. It doesn't go very far. What we ask for, it's la petite mort. But in the end, it's clear that this is what we ask and that the drive is tightly entwined with the demand of lovemaking. To faire l'amour, if you will, and here's a pun, to faire l'amourir, to do it to death, uh, in any case, this is precisely where the restful side of post-orgasm resides. If the, if the demand for death is what gets satisfied, well, good gracious, Lacan says, it's lightly satisfied because one gets off lightly. So to get off lightly then, our second pun of this passage, so to get off lightly, um, not only in the sense of escaping a punishment more severe, but in the sense of getting off not fully, only partially, only lightly. Perhaps Lacan is suggesting that it is really only lightly that one gets off at all. This relates to one of the points with which we began, that detumescence marks the impossibility of fully satisfying desire. To get off fully would entail something closer, it seems, to being offed, or to offing oneself, as the idioms go, 
idioms that illustrate quite nicely, I think, the link between castration and death. So it is not that castration anxiety is the same as death anxiety. But rather, what Lacan says is that castration anxiety refers back to the field in which death ties in closely to the renewal of life. And here we have entered into the domain where the relation of symbolic castration in its imaginary dimension opens on to the real. The register of the real whereby a certain form of life is transmitted and sustained. An aspect of the real is at issue here, something that maintains what Freud articulated at the level of his nirvana principle as life's property of having to pass in order to get to death by way of forms that reproduce those that gave individual form the opportunity of occurring through the conjunction of two sexual cells. This tendency of the mental apparatus to reduce itself to a nullity, as Freud established it in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, finds in Lacan's reading a slight revision. It is not just the sheer reduction to nothingness that would be marked by Freud's development of the Nirvana Principle. It is instead for Lacan an always incomplete nothingness, a non-identity of non-being with itself. This is what is sought in sexual coupling, it seems, for Lacan. And this, too, is marked by detumescence. So while Beyond the Pleasure Principle would certainly be the Freudian text to turn to for thinking the questions of death and pleasure in Freud, um, Lacan seems to be more concerned in Seminar 10 with articulating Freud's account in Inhibition, Symptoms, and Anxiety. So here I'm following suit, although I think in a larger project I would want to um, think through um, this point in Freud um, in particular in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Interestingly, in Freud's more encompassing <coughs> concept of castration as he develops it in inhibition, <coughs> symptoms, and anxiety, um, where, as we've said, um, castration is understood as the significance of the loss of the object as a determinant of anxiety, and thought as the fundamental concept of separation as such, we find that castration is given a certain primacy, explaining ultimately the source and origin of anxiety. It's often said um, that one of the key moves that Freud makes in inhibition symptoms and anxiety is a, a kind of inversion of uh, a logic of causality, whereby anxiety is no longer understood as the cause of repression, as it was in Freud's earlier dynamic model, but anxiety is conceived of as the effect of something else. Um, and the something else ends up being the danger that's associated with castration. So, um, so you have this notion where anxiety was originally conceived of as this excess of energy that was the cause of repression. And then the shift that is made in inhibition symptoms and anxiety is that it's actually an effect of something else, um, which Freud then kind of um, attributes to some kind of vague notion of the, the structure of separation. Um, and it seems that Lacan is really of, of all of Freud's claims, the most dissatisfied with this. Right, so, um, um, yeah, okay, so um, in this more encompassing notion of um, castration anxiety as the source not only um, of anxiety itself, um, but of every anxiety, Freud, um, Freud writes, uh, or he attributes even the fear of death to uh, to this, this kind of all-encompassing problem of castration. He writes, since nothing resembling death can ever have been experienced, nie erlebt worden, um, that's just a flag that the, that the um, notion of experience that Freud is using here is, is erleben and not um, erfahren. So nothing resembling death can ever have been experienced, or if it has, as in fainting, it has left no observable traces behind. Therefore, the fear of death, Todesangst, should be regarded as analogous to the fear of castration. So one can see in Freud's analogy, I think, a, an instructive complement to Martin Heidegger's notion of being towards death. If, for Freud, the fear of death is a kind of analog to castration anxiety, because death itself can never be experienced, while various kinds of separation can be. For Heidegger, it is the same fact of death 
that it can't be experienced for oneself, that contributes to the existential priority of death, and that orients Dasein in being toward it. Introducing this in being in time, Heidegger writes, when Dasein reaches its wholeness in death, it simultaneously loses the being of the there, the sign of the Da, right? So the transition to no longer Dasein lifts Dasein right out of the possibility of experiencing. Now importantly, this is Erfahren and not Erleben. This transition. So th death lifts Dasein right out of the possibility of experiencing this transition and of understanding it as something experienced. This kind of thing is denied to each and every Dasein in relation to itself. For Heidegger, this point renders the death of others all the more significant, because das Dasein is, after all, fundamentally and essentially a being with others. Being towards death can be thought as being towards separation from others. Heidegger, Heidegger describes the relation of being to the dead as one in which there is still a being with. However, because being with always means being with one another in the same world. The deceased has abandoned our world and left it behind. Nonetheless, it is still in terms of this world that those remaining can still be with him. So we might at first be tempted to read Heidegger's point here as one that's analogous to Freud's in some way and to suggest a kind of being towards castration. If Dasein is a being who is essentially and fundamentally a being with others, then the Heideggerian being towards death as being towards the potential separation from others would be, as Freud says, analogous to the fear of castration. But Heider, Heidegger uh, complicates the notion that death can be thought in terms of separation. And what is important for the reading I want to begin to develop is that he does so in a way that is actually similar to a key Lacanian point. Heidegger poses the question of whether or not death actually marks the wholeness or fulfillment of Dasein at all. In order to think of death in terms of a separation, the question of whether Dasein is this wholeness or fulfillment in death comes into question. The seeming impossibility of ontologically grasping, grasping and determining Dasein as a whole renders it more difficult to think of death in terms of a separation. A different relation to the end is in view. Heidegger writes, the ending that we have in view when we speak of death does not signify a being at an end of Dasein, but rather a being toward the end of this being. Death is a way to be that Dasein takes over as soon as it is. As soon as a human being comes into life, he's old enough to die. The constitutive finitude of Dasein has a complement precisely in Lacan's revision of Freud's notion of castration, as the way in which the subject is split from itself in language. For Lacan, there is a reminder of this split of the human being in language and the relation of this to the incomplete satisfaction of orgasm, both of which have their imaginary support in detumescence. So Lacan's revision of Freud's notion of castration thus incorporates a sense of, Heidegger, of Heideggerian finitude, linking castration anxiety in a way, in a different way, a more specific way to the structuring function of castration as symbolic, having its imaginary support in the fact of detumescence and its existential implication in the dimension of the real. So, okay, so to conclude um, briefly, so to conclude, I'll return very briefly uh, to Graham's piece, Detumescence. With Lacan's elaborations of detumescence as a signifier now in tow, I hope we might see the work more specifically, what Graham called the psychosexual social whole that he aimed to create. This is not a whole that marks then a mere epistemological lack. It's not reducible to the fact, as Graham noted, that there is no account of detumescence in the literature, though I'm not sure what literature exactly he was referring to. Um, but it's rather, if we bring Lacan's discussion to bear in a reading of this work, thinking detumescence in its symbolic, imaginary, and real dimensions, the form and the fact of detumescence marks a whole around which the structures of signification emerge. And they emerge as the relation of being and non-being. To say that the piece is the whole 
might suggest that it is not just a hole marking the absence of this account itself of detumescence, but rather the piece itself is the very split between the presence and absence of the signifier and the image of which we find in the falling away of the phallus in detumescence. And in this piece, the signifier detumescence itself. Such a reading would bring together both the form of this piece with the matter of its content. The fact that Graham's piece offered no other image but the signifiers within the advertisement and in his explanation of it marks detumescence as a work about the materiality of the signifier, both in its form and conceptual content. That's all.